Fallacy reification. Kind of like uh, children are afraid of uh, monsters and they actually have uh, anxiety and panic attacks over things that don't exist. The ancient Indians actually discussed this at great detail. On It's called uh, the rope snake metaphor. Of course, back in the ancient days in India, if you went outside of your home to take a leak in the middle of the night, of course, you got bit by a snake, you're going to die. 99% of the time, you know, it's a poisonous snake. So sometimes people would see a piece of rope and they would think it was a snake and like an older person would have a heart attack and they die. So they died from something that uh, did not exist. And so we reify these things that are non-existent or we build structures as the ancients uh, would call them sky castles. In other words, complete fabrications like uh, leprechauns and unicorns and and this is what mathematicians do, unfortunately, and modern scientists are not actual scientists in the true Aristotelian or Platonic sense. What they are is mathematicians. And this is, of course, the reason why Nikola Tesla said that these people build foundations upon uh, uh, false realities and then they get buried. They're deep thinkers, but they can't think clearly, as Nikola Tesla said. You and I all grew up watching these idiot sci-fi movies like Star Trek, which is a TV series, and all these other idiot sci-fi movies talking about bending space-time. Well, we might as well be talking about bending unicorn farts because time is only a measure of magnitude. It is a measure. It is not a thing in and of itself. And this, of course, is a uh, posterior attribute reification, which is a fallacy and can't be enjoined also, too. Space, as I will quote Nikola Tesla because he was 100% accurate in stating this, this is the reason why he called Einstein a fuzzy-haired crackpot and a lunatic, is because space has no properties. It has attributes, just like a shadow. And a shadow, of course, is not a thing. Shadow is an absence of light. It is not a principle. It is said of something else in a state of juxtaposition, conjoinment. When this is present, that is present. When matter is present, light is present, then a shadow will be cast. But a shadow is not a thing. Of course, if you look in the English dictionary, of course, a shadow is a noun. But if we actually get into uh, hardcore philosophy and metaphysics, all of the way the Greeks and the Indians think, these, of course, are not things. They are privations. And, and space is, of course... It is exactly like a shadow. It is uh, not something that exists, just like emptiness. People talk about emptiness or chaos. There's no such thing as chaos. Uh, most chaos is just a near infinite complexity. And emptiness, of course, can't be enjoyed. Subject precedes object of negation. No one's ever experienced emptiness. This is why I've, uh, I love making fun of, uh, well, I love making fun of, but enjoy making fun of, uh, you know, these, uh, these anti-intellectual mental midget uh, Buddhists who are talking about experiencing emptiness. It's like, oh, you experienced it, right? Yeah, I did. So who was it that experienced it? Well, I did. So you were in there, but you still call it emptiness. So you've actually uh, contradicted the actual definition, denotation, and connotation of emptiness because there was a witness to it, and you remember experiencing it. So it wasn't empty by definition. It was not empty at all. What they're actually trying to say is pure subjectivity, but there's no such thing as emptiness. This is, of course, uh, uh, fallacy, uh, reification of uh, things that uh, don't exist. Um, space has no properties. It is not a thing. It can't be curved. Um, of course, we actually, and this ultimately gets to the two foundations of reality or cosmic mechanics, of which throughout the entire history of humanity, there has ever been po uh, posited only two foundations of reality. There could only be two uh, theories, uh, uh, and one is completely untenable. Two foundations of reality. One is uh, based upon uh, particle interactions, yeah, and that is, of course, atomism which is, of course, what modern scientists believe in, since they don't believe in the ether. But, uh, and the other one is the ether. These are the only two foundations upon which cosmic mechanics, field theory, and ultimate reality, the big UR, the capital letters, could ever be made. And, of course, uh, uh, mutual particle interactions, or what I call the cult of bumping particles, can't be enjoined. Gravity, as I've stated in a prior video, and, of course, it takes a lot of delineation, is the reason why the fourth edition of my book on magnetism is not out yet, takes a lot of time to write it, and there's going to ultimately be six editions, is that gravity is, of course, an anti-field. It's not a thing in and of itself. It's the acceleration towards counter space of the loops of magnetic force vectors, which are themselves, of course, expanding loops of toroidal centrifugal divergence. It is literally the erasure 
of the ether torsion vectors that magnetism is a toroidal force geometry, centrifugal force geometry thereof, the collapse of this return to counter space, increasing inertia and acceleration. There's no such thing as bending. Everything is fields, ultimately, of course, and fields are not particles. You can never explain, for example, uh, EPR. You can never explain instantaneous action at a distance. You can never explain, without breaking the law of conservation of energy, the nature by which and through which and in which light uh, behaves. It's called a speed, but rather it's rate of induction through various mediums. Like, for example, if you actually pass uh, light through glass, depends on the glass, slows down by roughly 30%, slows down, I forget how much, through water, 17% or something like that. You could not explain light as an emission. Ultimately, and this is what is really important and nobody's talking about on YouTube or anywhere else, is that I like getting down to the basement floor, the foundation of anything and everything, because you can always tear down stupidity and tear down ignorance at its very foundation. Everybody is up here on the second and third floor arguing over pathetic damn minutia, but that's not important. If the foundation is either completely illogical or at fault. We don't have to discuss what's up on the second or third floor of a sky palace built out of nonsense. You know, we're talking about how many leprechauns can ride on the back of a unicorn. Where we're arguing about how fat or big or leprechauns are and how many can ride on a unicorn, they gotta get to the foundations of, well, there's no such thing as unicorns. We don't have to argue have a debate or a discussion about how many damn unicorns and how fat they are or skinny they are and how many you could fit on the back of a unicorn because there's no such thing as damn unicorns, right? So this is getting to the foundation of things. And there's only ever two foundations to ultimate reality or cosmic mechanics or field theory. One is based in atomism, mutual uh, particle interaction, or they call it the cult of bumping particles, and the other one is the ether. There's no such thing as curved space-time. Time itself is not a thing. Every ancient culture, and this would take like an hour-long video in itself, has said that time is the number four, okay? We have monad, mind, magnitude, matter, and man. Well, not man, but I just say man because it's an M. It would be ontos. Time is not in the first five numbers or any number of the Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci sequence is one, one, two, three, five. Let's do that again. One, one, two, three, five of the Fibonacci sequence. What number there is missing? Well, the number is four. Every ancient culture, both Greek and Indian and Egyptian, said four was the number for time. Time does not exist. Now, of course, for empirical beings who have measure and volume and mass, yeah, a psychophysical composite being, of course, time is very real. Yeah, but time itself is not a thing. It doesn't have any substance to it. It is not part of ultimate reality. It is nothing other than a measure of magnitudes. Space has no properties. It only has attributes, just like a shadow. Shadow is not a thing. Shadow is an absence of light. Space is literally the after effect of a centrifugal divergent magnetic field. The notion of curved space-time is the reification of concepts to fit within the model of atomism. Yeah. This is dielectric acceleration, the exact same thing idiot scientists and human beings have been calling magnetic attraction for countless thousands of years because we actually had lodestones that the Chinese and the ancient Greeks found. And who, uh, who else knows what other ancient cultures are fascinated by lodestones? You actually break them off and they'd, you know, accelerate towards one another. And this notion of magnetic attraction has existed since time immemorial. But magnetism is by definition centrifugal force divergence. Okay, yeah, centrifugal force in motion divergence. It is really the fundamental force vector of the entire universe. Gravity is not a thing in and of itself. It is an anti-field. The notion of uh, curved space-time is an impossibility. It's like talking about bending unicorns or talking about leopard. These things don't exist. These are concepts created by human beings to give uh, uh, conceptual reification for discussion and for writing and for countless other things, for communication, to the empirical world of form and phenomenality. But time is not a thing at all. And space has no properties. There's no such thing as curved space-time. And then when I actually say stuff like that, people will say, well, what about when it was observed that uh, the light from so-and-so star uh, was curved, you know, uh, when we actually had an eclipse of the, eclipse of the a solar eclipse? We noticed that the light was curved. That must be bent space-time. 
No, it's not. That's an electrokinematic effect. Light is a coaxial circuit. The longitudinal rarefaction is compressions along the dielectric. Transverse electrical magnetic, I mean, what do you think is being bent? I mean, light is, of course, an energy packet. Photons don't exist. It's not a particle emission. It's dielectric acceleration of the coaxial circuit of light towards an, an extremely large gravitational mass. Non-point source mutual mass acceleration. There's no distinction between energy and matter when it actually comes towards dielectric acceleration. As far as the light being bent, not being bent, literally, because it's an ether perturbation. And, of course, light doesn't move, and it's not an emission from point A to point B. It's an ether perturbation. And the so-called speed of light is, of course, the rate of induction. It's the rate of induction of the ether against itself with a known uh, force. Uh, well, actually, it'd be, uh, the, it would actually be the ether torsion. The rate of induction is the ether torsion uh, of the ether against itself, in, in the case of the EMR, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, which is the coaxial circuit of light. Of course, all ether perturbations are either longitudinal or circular or transverse. Though we're simply talking about ether perturbations. Of course, I've talked endlessly about light. It's not an emission. Nothing emits light. Uh, it's an ether perturbation with a given rate of induction. But you can never explain it as an emission in the cult of atomism because you'd break the law of conservation of energy after light speeds back up after it leaves glass or water, for example. You can't explain it that way. If you think light is an emission, then you've already fundamentally broken the law of thermodynamics and uh, the law of conservation of energy. It, it can't work. It can't work. Once again, there has ever, never been anything postulated in the entire history of the world other than atomism and the ether. And only the ether has logically, intelligently, and through the prism of Occam's razor, uh, explained the nature of all observed field phenomena interactions. Both light and electricity and gravity and magnetism, only the ether is the correct explanation wherein which by which that you can logically explain all observed phenomena. You can't do that with atomism. You can't have these one-way communicating particles. I mean, if you literally this is as, as stupid as these pathetic idiots are, these mathematicians. They're not scientists. The true scientists is Aristotelian, Platonic, or Pythagorean scientists. They're mathematicians. They will literally tell you that's what's what... This is not my view. This is their view. What's going on between magnets is the exchange of... These are their words. The exchange of virtual particles. Virtual particles is purely conceptual invention like unicorns and leprechauns. These have not been the inputs or outputs of any experiments ever done by anybody. These are abstraction, conceptual abstractions with no basis in reality. These people are fools. Now, let me be clear and concise. Well, how could they be a fool? They have a PhD in physics. You can be an extre extremely intelligent idiot. And this is the huge difference between empirical knowledge and wisdom, i.e. epistemi and gnosis. I have an if you actually think accurately, met many, many people that are incredibly intelligent, but they are fundamentally morons. They have a lot, I mean, some of them are human calculators. I mean, there's like that famous autistic guy uh, that was uh, modeled after the movie Rain Man. You know, the guy can sit there and, you know, just roll his eyes in the back of his head. You could ask him an abstruse mathematical question. It's just incredibly complex, and he'll, he'll just roll his eyes for a few minutes, and he'll give you the answer. But he can't even tell you how to correctly flush a toilet. You know, he doesn't know how to drive a car. You know, bless his heart. You know, I'm not picking on the guy, but he is an incredibly intelligent fool. You know, I'm not blaming him for what he is. I mean, he can't help it. He's born that way, but Here's a perfect example of what a modern scientist is. They're not scientists, they're mathematicians. They think deeply, but they can't think clearly. You know, to actually have logical answers and uh, you know, phenomenal discoveries, you actually have to both think deeply and clearly. But they can't. They get lost down countless rabbit holes of mathematics. And I'm not against math, but math has never explained anything. Math, by its very definition, is not about explaining anything. It's about calculating things. These are the reason why these people are atomists, because they believe if you can't count it, then it doesn't really exist. And they want nothing to do with you can't count, can't count it. But a field, can't, a field in itself, of itself, by itself, cannot be quantized. 
The four Maxwellian field equations only define a field with a vector over a period of time with a given result, such as joules, watts, amps, volts. That is an effect, and effects can be counted. Yes, they can be quantized, and this is where the word quantum came in, yeah? Once we can quantize it, then we can count it, and if we can count it, then it's math! And they think that is science. It's not, it's mathematics. True science is getting to the heart of what something is and explaining what it is and how it works, and that is not math. And this is a huge difference between empirical knowledge and wisdom. Huge, huge difference. But there's no such thing as bent space-time. Nikola Tesla made fun of this, so did uh, James Clerk Maxwell, so did Oliver Heaviside. Oliver Heaviside actually said the notion of a charge-carrying particle, i.e. the electron, was a psychosis, a mental disorder, which of course it is. You think that like uh, the power running in your power lines in your backyard is like uh, you know, a bunch of like microscopic BBs you know, flowing through a rain. I mean, you're, you're just deluded. I mean... Um, uh, wireless power induction in a total vacuum completely dismisses that. Ask a scientist, excuse me, sir, if, uh, if power is the movement of electrons. Yes, yes, sir, I'm, I'm with you, I'm with you. If <laughs> power transfer is the movement of electrons in a system, then how do you explain wireless power induction in a vacuum? Oh, mm. <laughs> The easiest way to destroy him is, that, excuse me, sir, how does light speed back up after it leaves glass without breaking the law of conservation of energy? Mmm, oh, they don't like questions like that. So, excuse me, Mr. Scientist, if you can't actually, in a very few simple words, tell me what a field is, not a field in an expression with a result over a period of time, if you can't tell me what a field is, then you are not a scientist, and this is very true. If you can't explain what a field is, then there's no chance in hell you're a scientist, much less a PhD of science. Well, I have a PhD. That's not true. Yeah, you got a PhD, but you're just a highly educated idiot. That's all you are. What is a field, sir? This is not a trick question. What is a field? Well, ah, uh, ah. Uh. No, what is a field? It's not a trick question. What's a field? they will get bug-eyed and stare. I've actually had a lot of people do that to their professors. They took my advice and they said, yes, Mr. B professor, tell me what a field is. Could you tell me what a field is? What is a field? No answer. Crickets chirping. What's a field? A field, by the way, if you want to know, is an ether perturbation modality. Wasn't that really simple? That was really simple. Yeah. Ether per a modality. Kind of like ice, water, and steam are different temperature and pressure modalities of water. It's that simple. That's what a field is. A field is an ether perturbation modality. They're either a centrifugal, increasing uh, force of motion, or either centripetal, increasing inertia and acceleration. Everything is either uh, centrifugal divergence or centripetal convergence. Mother Nature is really simple. She's like a hairy armpit chick w with muddy feet. Yeah? That's how simple Mother Nature is. These idiot scientists, they want to complicate Mother Nature. Mother Nature is not complex. The universe can't work that way. It's impossible. It's illogical. It's untenable. It's irrational. Ir irrational. <laughs> irrational, excuse me. This is what happens when my mind thinks about 10 things at once. I invented a new word. I said irrational. I meant to say irrational. Literally, that's how my mind is quite often. I'm thinking about 10 things at once and speaking at the same time sometimes. <sighs> Mother Nature is a hairy armpit chick with muddy feet. She is not a crazy hooker on crack with a bag of magic bumping particles. It can't work that way. The universe can't work that way. <laughs> it's untenable. That's a great word everybody should learn. Repeat after me. Untenable. Thank you so much. I hope you liked those videos. If you do, you can click the link below. Or you can tell me how much you hate me. Whatever makes you happy, whatever floats your boat, whatever tickles your pickle, whatever wiggles your worm. Yes, thank you so much for watching. Peace out, Girl Scout. Lux e veritas. Yes.